Hey, welcome to your favorite show, What the Tech. Today, I'll be talking about uh, how technology is actually helping people leaders to improve employee experience and performance. Uh, we'll be diving in uh, deeply into how HR leaders can use technology to improve their employee experience, which uh, will actually lead to better outcomes. And uh, we'll be discussing how HR technology can actually assist in recruitment and, and onboarding uh, technologies like applicant tracking systems, onboarding software, and how they can actually streamline the hiring process and really make it more efficient for HR leaders. Um, this also allows them to focus on finding the best fit for their team rather than actually spending time on administrative tasks. Uh, and, and additionally, uh, we'll be actually touching on performance tracking and goal setting software that is actually helping HR leaders track employee progress and set attainable goals for development. And, and lastly, uh, the real kicker here is that uh, employee engagement and retention uh, side of things. Um, with so many options out there, and how, how do you actually narrow down what is most important and effective in, in really gathering uh, valuable information on employee satisfaction and assisting and actually uh, creating a positive work culture? And so... This can lead to uh, you know great things within an organization like higher retention rates and uh, overall improving the uh, employee experience, uh, which obviously helps improve the results for the organization. So uh, I really want you to uh, stay tuned for an exciting episode on how technology is going to change uh, the HR industry in the near future and is, is currently evolving things uh, here on What the Tech. So grab your popcorn, sit down, get ready. Here we go. All right. Today's guest is the Director of Human Resources for Big Communications. Uh, it's a U.S.-based communications agency, and Kelly is actually responsible for building a uh, scalable employee uh, and talent ac acquisition uh, strategy. Uh, she's focused on mentorship, employee relations, career planning, and, and she's really uh, going after uh, the, the employee experience to help move the business forward. Uh, she also has over 25 years of HR experience, and, and she's actually worked for top agencies and brands, which include MicroMass Communications, MedThink Communications, and Sterling Healthcare. And today, uh, she's going to be sharing her amazing, amazing <laughs> insights and strategy uh, around technology solutions and how she's using these to streamline HR uh, processes and, and really helping to create a, a winning culture for her organization. So I really want to thank you uh, for being here with me today. Uh, Kelly, uh, welcome to uh, What the Tech. Thank you so much, Troy. I'm really excited to be here today and have a conversation and to do all the things. Do all the things. Hey, yeah. why not, right? Do all the things. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so glad to have you on the show today. And um, I read an interesting article uh, that maybe you can elaborate on a little bit. Uh, but as I was reading through it, it was on actually on the website um, uh, for the agency that you work for. Um, and it was highlighting your focus on understanding kind of a, the, the fir people first mentality. Um, yeah. But while doing so, I actually learned uh, that you kind of tripped into the human resource like industry about 25 years ago. And so I'm curious to yeah. learn more about the people first mentality, but also like how does one trip into human resources and how have you been like uh, able to make such a, a, a great run at it, you know, with it kind of being an accidental thing? <laughs> that, great questions. Um, so first of all, I went to school to become a buyer. I wanted to work in the fashion industry and all the things, you know, that 18, 19 year old thinks that they want to do when they embark in college. And you really don't know what you want to do sometimes until you start that path. And I was very lucky. I had a counselor who said, yeah, you're really good at this. But if you took additional courses in marketing, you're really better with people. And so, <laughs> right? I, OK, that's oh, thank you. So I then went into a management role and the management role was in retail, started off as an, a junior buyer and I hated it, just like my counselor thought that I would. <laughs> and so I was able then to transition into the store level and the store level had junior management. And I was so incredibly lucky to work with such great professionals and so many women in the industry that showed up for each other. And that was something we're going, it, we've already said many years I've been doing this. So we're going back to the late eighties and in the late eighties to see women showing up for each other and empowering each other, especially, you know, someone very young 
that was that was fantastic to me. Well, that career then springboarded into sales and sales then led to human resources. And so I've always been someone that's been focused on relationships. And I think that's where the people first mentality comes from is as an employer, your responsibility is to look after your people. I mean, there's two schools of thought. And one of them is, you know, no, the employees look out for the company, then the company looks out for the employees. And I think the best organizations look out for their people first, the people feel that, then they look out for the company that they work for. And I've tried to associate myself with organizations, leaders, mentors, colleagues that embrace people. People matter. And there is so much about human resources that's fascinating. And there's so many things about human resources that gets a bad rap. I, everyone wants to do all the fun things. No one wants to sit down and, and write a policy. Most people don't. It's hard to write a job description. It's hard to sit down and get down to the details if you are focused on setting an organization up for success, you've got to bring it right back to the people. And that's somewhat, you know, a little synopsis of me of how I tripped into it. I literally thought I was going to do one thing with my life. And instead, it's become human resources. It's now people operations. It's building the relationships. It is making sure, you know, there's so many buzzwords out there and culture can be overused, but you need to create a culture, an environment where people want to be there. Not every day people are going to want to be there because we all have bad days. Anybody that says that they don't is very lucky or delusional. It's something that <laughs> we, you know, one of the two, but it's something that I think that if you are in a role within an organization and you know your impact matters, you're, you are valued and you're contributing to an overall objective that everyone else is buying into, that's a great feeling. And it doesn't, always feel like work. So again, I guess that, does that answer your question about how I tripped into it, it and what I'm trying to do? Okay. It does. Uh, yeah. I accidentally fell into this industry too. I, I remember, um, so I, I came in by way of uh, technology with ADP some years ago, um, selling HR technology. And I just, okay. I remember looking at the person uh, that was the hiring manager and saying, because uh, I was coming from a completely different industry. And I said, people buy this? Like I, I had no idea. I was like, I was completely bewildered by like people buying technology and HR services. I was like, I thought like most companies had all that stuff, you know, in house. Um, and so we were, you know, doing business process outsourcing. And I just remember like, it was like drinking from a fire hose, having to learn compliance, having mm -hmm. to learn, you know, just like uh, the, the, you know, uh, the, the structure of human resources, how many, there, there are so many different disciplines from, you know, uh, recruiting to, you know, compliance to, uh, you know, uh, people and, and generalists to, to, to specialists. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'm sure like you, you, you know, getting into it as a people business, but there's so many technical aspects to it that I, I think are really challenging yeah. uh, as well. And, you know, the, the, the cool thing I've enjoyed about it because I'm always somebody who like, I need to be stretched, right. Is yes. that it's always changing. Like how it was yes. five years ago. That's not how it's done anymore. Right. Right. Uh, and so I love that. Um, it sounds like you, you've enjoyed it too. I have. Absolutely. I think that's a very good point is the it's fluid. Right. And so to truly feel passionate in human resources and to want to help an organization build and scale and structure, it needs to be fluid. And there's so many resources out there now, you know, that are technology based that can help do that, that are centered around engagement, that are centered around people. And there used to be the dichotomy where you've got technology or you have people, and now you can see them merge and see how technology can help you take care of your people. So yeah. it's been, it's been fascinating. And it has exciting. been fascinating. So let me ask this. I, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're going to dig deeper into that. I know we're going to dig deeper into that, but I want everybody to get to know you really quick. So we're going to do our awkward moment. Uh, awesome. And I'm going to ask you, yeah, hopefully you're excited about that. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm going to ask you a lightning round of 10 awkward questions. And I really Great. just want the first thing that pops into your head. That's the only way this uh, really works. And honestly, just have fun with it. There's no right okay. answers. Uh, and remember, there's no consequences. Um, okay. You may have some friends that snicker at you like, say, what? What did you say? But other than that, it'll just be, you know, water cooler talk. <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. Let's, let's give it a whirl. 
So, uh, like I said, quick succession, you know, as soon as you give me the answer, I'll be on to the next one unless you make me laugh. And then we'll probably, or I might have a follow-up question, but uh, okay. it might turn into 13 questions or 14 questions, uh, but awesome. I only have 10 questions for it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So are you ready? Yep. Let's go. All right. Are reindeers real creatures? Yes. Okay. All right. So what's the fastest speed you've ever driven your car? 110 miles an hour. Nice. Nice. uh how often uh is it healthy to cry whenever needed for frequency i know a lot of men to be honest with you don't like don't cry right how 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 many times is it awkward if 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 a man cries a couple times a year i think that probably is healthy if he if he cries more than that does it become unhealthy or weird no no <laughs> okay. mental health mental health right. is huge and you cry when you need to cry the reason i asked that is because you know growing up like that was not the thing like you don't cry you know right you could be bleeding you from your head there, there's no crying here no wipe it off and keep rolling <laughs> yeah, and that's, rub some dirt that's on not it. necessarily how's that healthy and i think yeah. we're discovering a lot of things that aren't healthy that are associated with that so no cry yeah. when you need to Okay, cry when you need to. All right, getting presents or giving presents? Giving. Giving. Okay. Why do you Why do you love giving? Because it gives me the opportunity to remind somebody how much they mean to me, and I try to be a thoughtful giver. If I see something, I buy presents year round that I may save for Christmas or birthday or for a down day, just because people give give me so much that is so intrinsic, and I want to do something for someone else. So I enjoy giving. Yes, I love giving too. Uh, they, I, I've you know, I've heard love languages, you know, I think you've ever heard that a lot of times yes. people who give gifts also like to receive this gifts. Uh, and they typically like to do things for people that they actually enjoy. So, uh, you, yeah. you know, you, you, you probably enjoy a good gift, especially a thoughtful one, I would assume yes. as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's great. I, yeah. I hate gift cards. I hate them. I hate you them. Know what? They tell me you didn't think about it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to change your thoughts on that. I received a gift card for my birthday. And it was from a friend and she said, I want to give you an experience. And it was a gift card actually to Umstead, to the spa. Oh, I love Umstead, yeah. Okay, but that is not something that I would do for myself. Sure. And I thought it was the most thoughtful gift. And I can understand how gift cards may seem, well, I didn't put any thought into it. But I think that if you look at it like they actually did think about you and they didn't want to disappoint you. So here's something. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I guess it's more of like a, a gift card to Subway, which I never eat out, uh, eat at in the first place because they make terrible sandwiches. Sorry, the commercials are okay, but the sandwiches are terrible. Um, yeah. <clears throat> no offense to Subway, uh, but uh, but in my in my experience, it's it's really been one of those situations where I'm like, um, you know, you give me a gift card to a place that I'd never go to, but that one was really thoughtful because you know she was trying yeah. to get you to do something that you know you yeah. hadn't. Or you wouldn't do on yourself because, you know, obviously that's a very lavish gift. Yes. And it was very thoughtful. It, yeah. It, uh, yeah. Umstead. Yes. Yeah. So hashtag awesome friend in that scenario. And don't listen to Troy. Yes. Gift cards are awesome if they're to the spot, the Umstead. There you go. <laughs> we have to put qualifiers on there. But yeah. Right. Okay. Next question. You ready? Yes. Have you ever tasted soap? Yes. On purpose? No. No? No. <laughs> Just got a little in your mouth? You know, it, maybe it was on purpose because I continued to say the words that my mother did not want me to say. So I had oh. the opportunity to taste some soap. <laughs> Thank you, you know? mother. Like yeah. naughty words. You know, what my mom yeah. used to do, she didn't put soap in my mouth. She put hot sauce in my mouth. I wouldn't eat hot sauce until I was 25 years old because of that. Oh yeah. I don't blame you. That is awful. Yeah. I, that, no, no, no. Yeah. I know to she, avoid soap. Yeah. She got to the point where she would just take the bottle out and she'd stick her finger on it. She'd shake it and she'd be like, you want some of this? (laughs) And I was like, oh, Uh, yeah, keep going. Yeah. yeah. Keep talking. You'll get keep sassing me, boy. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So if you were really hungry, would you eat a bug? No, no, just starve. No, starve. No bugs. No. Have you ever watched uh, fear factor? Yes. I feel like I could do everything, but eat the bugs. I I would. I would love to attempt everything. I'm not sure I'd be successful at anything, but no, those bugs I'd be tapping out. Yeah. Congratulations to the opponents. It was a good run. Take my, you know, bloody bruised body someplace else, but no, no to the bugs. No yeah, to the bugs. No to the bugs. I'm with you. No, no the to the bugs. All right. No to the bugs. Um, would you eat a day old taquito from seven eleven? No. No? No. Would you eat would you eat a fresh one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'd eat not quite as bug. bad as a bug. 
but yeah, you know, that's what I mean. I'd eat it before the bug. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. They um, may go hand in hand. They might. They might. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're on the same uh, food pyramid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, next one. What sound does a seal make? Give it your best shot. I, guess, I think it's pretty good. I could have done the whole, yeah, yeah I tried. You, you know, I, I, I have a, ch well, my child is now 22, but you used to, when you read the books, you make the animal noises. And yeah. I yeah. love a good animal noise. Who doesn't? Well, you know, it, it's something that it goes into your catalog of experience, right? There's some things that go on a resume. There's some things that don't, you know, being able to make animal sounds. That's not on there, but you do have the capability. I, uh, yeah. I, I can bark like a little dog, like a chihuahua. And I'm not going to do it. But if, uh, if you see me on the street, I will do it for you in person. I, I, it sounds just like a chihuahua. I, could, I scare people with it. Like I'm a little ferocious chihuahua. Yep. Not going to do it now, but like I said. I will do it in person. Uh, so most embarrassing store you might be seen shopping at? Gosh, I don't know. I honestly, I've, you, a store's a store. Okay, and let's, let's, let's there, caveat it. Okay. Let's get rid of store. Let's, let's do a uh, eating establishment. Like I would crush a McDonald's Sunday right now. <laughs> So you would you so what what would be the most embarrassing uh, probably restaurant that I would walk into yeah and have me seen at Subway yeah. Subway oh Subway no way no I, way uh, I, just, I think their I bread's cannot, made of rubber I cannot do it I know I just know no yeah just no and no offense to Subway because they've got their target market it is not me it's not you so, okay so we're on the same same boat me. there. Uh, it's not like a guilty pleasure pleasure. You'd be like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in there. I would not go in there. No. You know, the bread smells okay until you eat it. Yeah. it. you know, it, it, yes, it does. But sometimes it does not. You could just tell when it, no. And I used to work yeah. by one and maybe that's part of my aversion. Oh yeah. To it. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. And then they, they, you know, I don't know. Uh, Gaffigan says, you know, they, they're kind of cheap with the meat and they're like, they, you know, they pull them out like they're dollar bills and they like roll them onto your food. <laughs> That's gross. And it just looks slimy sometimes. And I yeah. just know. Yeah. yeah just know. All right. Last one. Would you go okay. to Disneyland alone? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do, do tell. I'm not afraid to go to places by myself. I'll Good go out you. to eat by myself. I'll go to movies by myself. I mean, that's actually part of what I love about myself. And I've had to grow into that is I'm, I enjoy doing things by myself and for myself. So, you yeah, know, there's people, yeah, that, that won't go to a movie by themselves. And, you know, I would have no problem sitting there by myself. Um, I'm a fan of myself. Yeah, you know, exactly. Why not, right? <laughs> I am fun. <laughs> I, I know what I like to do. I'm not trying to make somebody else happy. Why would I not do something by myself? There you go. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for participating in the lightning round. Uh, I had a good, good fun with that. Hopefully it wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't anything in there that uh, was too difficult to answer. It looks like you, you were, no. you were prepared except for the shopping one. So uh, we'll work on that one, but yeah, uh, we'll work on that know, one. I'm going to have to really yeah. think about that. Yeah. 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 For sure. I do everything. Amazon. Okay. Uh -huh. I know. Right. Don't we all? Yeah. Um, all right. So now that everybody uh, feels like they know you, um, let's kind of take a, a stroll down memory lane here. Uh, you know, let's talk about kind of the beginning and, and let's bring it forward okay. to the, the, the present. Um, so with the direction that HR is, is going nowadays, because it's, it's changed immensely um, and specifically maybe around technology and, and some of the ways, you know, we're going with that. You know, how is it uh, how is it kind of equipping teams like yours to kind of move the ball forward, you know, what's changed in the last 25 years the most um, in the industry um, and how has maybe technology attributed to that? So it's so, it's difficult to pinpoint what has changed the most. Mm -hmm. What I have seen is there has become such a greater focus on employee experience. And while that's been evolving throughout the years, and mm -hmm. employee satisfaction, and you hear, hear about turnover, and we focus on retention, talent acquisition retention. I think that the pandemic shifted everything because so many people had to go, and now they're working from home. Right. And so technology had to keep up with that. And whether it's Slack, whether it was 
Zoom, and you've got different mechanisms for communication, but your engagement now has to be very intentional. And I think that's something that has been in play for years, but forced into habit. You have got to, you take for granted that you're going to pass somebody in the hall and then you're going to be able to ask them that question that, oh, by the way, you're working on the same account or, hey, what about that sale? Or, hey, let's follow up about that conversation. You don't have that. That that went away. So mm-hmm. then you had to become very intentional in your communication. And when you talk about human resources, we're talking about an employee's experience and we're talking about it's not just how they interface with technology. How do they interface with their team members? How are they focusing on their career growth? How are they communicating that? How are they, do you, have you created a comfortable space and a, an environment for that type of communication? Are you trusted? Do they feel valued? Do they feel that they have impact? And these are conversations that you didn't have 25 years ago. You know, it, no one really cared. Did you show up for work? Are you late? When did you clock in? And you were micromanaged, whether it was intentionally or not, down to the minute in many, many organizations. Right. And as that has evolved and management has not necessarily become management, it's become leadership and mentorship. And we see the value in taking the intrinsic gifts that you may have as a leader and lifting up others. And when you're a leader and you are in a management role, your job is to grow the others. And when you grow the others, you're growing yourself. And again, I think that's more an evolution. So when we talk about technology, there are many different platforms. Before you used to pay somebody, right? You just paid somebody, then became a payroll system. And ooh, you could capture some HR data in there. And now you've got these full-blown HR um, management system, HRIS systems. You've got integrations that are happening all around with different platforms that are making it easier to communicate and engage with your employees at different levels globally. And that to me is absolutely fascinating. There are a lot of disconnects that we've had in the past. I think the pandemic forced some evolution and now there's a progression towards balance. There's a progression towards an employee being validated, an employee being heard, an employee being engaged. And that's where the real talent acquisition and retention comes from. And to me, retention is all about employee engagement. And I think that you're going to see that more and more as a metric versus a speaking point. Does that make sense? Yeah. How, how would you feel like, what do you feel are like the, the important things to measure when it comes to that? And how has maybe technology made it easier? Um, because I, I do think that in some cases, and this has been my experience, sometimes we go overkill on technology. Um, yeah. you know, too much, too soon, too often. Um, and so how do you, how do you strike a balance with those things as well? That's a great question. I think that again, it has to come down to being intentional communication to me, it should facilitate communication, not replace it mm-hmm. and don't rely on a system any, any more than you would on just talking to someone. I think that they can go hand in hand you know, we, we are at big, we're integrating a performance management platform with our HRIS system. And Mm -hmm. what that's going to do for us is it's going to facilitate one-on-one conversations. It's going to facilitate career growth. It's going to facilitate an ongoing conversation where we are making sure we've got an opportunity for employee surveys that, that can be anonymous and that you can share how you're feeling, that it'll come directly to me. It doesn't have to go to a manager And there's going to be some anonymity to that that they may not have. I think it's understanding that there could be some people that absolutely want to come to you and say, this is what's going on and I want you to fix it. And they don't care who you tell. Because in human resources, I don't think I should ever take something that someone says to me directly to the person of concern unless I've been given permission to do that. And so... With this, with technology, we're going to be able to facilitate different venues for conversation. We're going to be able to know where someone is at in their career path, help them carve out the next step, look at the teamwork. And there's an integration with this performance management system with Slack. So any shout outs, any kudos, any, hey, it was great to work with you on this team is going to go directly back to their profile 
in the performance management system, which then also is integrated with HRIS. So it's going to be on the personnel file, you know, and those personnel files are no longer hard copy anymore, of course, but it's going to be something that ties back that's going to create a story. And it's going to take a lot of the, I, I hate to use the word confrontation, but when you talk about employee evaluation or employee metrics and measurements, it can become very stressful and people are concerned and, oh my gosh, I've got to, I, get my, I get my performance eval. I don't think any performance evaluation should ever feel like a surprise. It should just be a continuation or a summary of the conversation that has been taking place over the year. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm looking for when I come to the table with my human resource beliefs is that we're having conversations. No one is blindsided. And if they are, I need you to tell me how and where so I can go and fix it. You know, there's um, an opportunity for exit interviews and it's created in the survey and we've been doing exit interviews. Exit interviews can be helpful, but they can be an absolute waste of time if you do nothing with that information. And so, again, that goes back to the conversations. Do people have your trust? Are you building a relationship where people know that they can come to you with their deepest, darkest thoughts and you're there to help them? Or do they fear you? And technology, again, bringing this back to technology, there's a lot of different ways that it can facilitate a conversation that may never have taken place before. So I look at it as a tool. I don't look at it as the solid answer. To me, it's just one one more thing that can continue to help our organization invest in our people. And I believe that most organizations out there that are looking at that with the mindset of how can we help versus how could we hurt. And, and don't get me wrong. I know that there are organizations out there that are that may have the perspective of, well, this is going to tell us whether or not John Smith is doing everything that we're asking him to do. Well, that's the accountability you're putting on your employee. What accountability are you as an organization taking upon yourself? And so technology can help facilitate all of that. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, my, my experience um, with, with some of these systems is that, you know, the, the frequency of things that need to happen. You, you talked about having open lines of communication and um, not, you know, having it be an event and certainly not having things be a surprise. You know, what are some best practices to do that? Because, you know, I've heard things like, you know, pulse surveys is the way to go. Like, how do we take what we want to get, you know, from our, our employees from a feedback standpoint and what we want to communicate with them? How do we, how do we, you know, take those into, ball, you know, smaller bite-sized pieces and communicate those, um, you know, throughout the year? And, and you know, poll surveys is one way to do that. But, like, what are some strategies you've, you've taken and implemented? So there can be pulse surveys. Again, I think that the focus needs to be on the end product. So there's different mechanisms. You can do a pulse survey. You can do weekly one-on-ones. You can do right. monthly regroups. You can set somebody up a new hire with a 30, 60, 90 day action plan with different metrics and objectives to achieve. You can do quarterly check-ins to measure against progress. There's a lot of different check-ins and conversations that you can schedule. You can do surveys. That's fantastic. What you need to do then with that information is actually create an action plan and steps and follow through. I was a member of an organization that believed very heavily in pulse surveys and it never went anywhere. So not only do you have people doing these things, but now they're starting to see why am I doing these things if there's no change, if there's no initiative, if there's no action. So having the tools, again, is one thing, taking that tool and the the information derived from it and actually influencing change to me is what matters. And technology can help you do that as well. You can set up so many different um, ways to communicate with somebody, but then it's, here's an action plan. What if it's a living document? What if that document is actually housed and you're in the performance management tool and this is your document and these are the things that we're checking off and this is the feedback that you've received. And oh, by the way, we are unable to touch base this week, but right here in the system, I can provide you this input. There's, it's, again, they're, they're tools. They're not the answer, but they can help facilitate the steps to build something as a positive experience for someone. And I think, again, it's it's asking the right questions. What do we need? What are we willing to do? And what are we willing? And that's key. What are we willing to integrate into our organization as a standard? You can go out and buy all the tools in the world, but if you've got three out of five managers that aren't using them, then you've got... All of their employees that aren't receiving the exact same benefits 
as the rest of the organization. So it's something that has to become ingrained in your culture. This is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. And this is a commitment that we're making to ourselves and to our team members. And I think that's as important, if not more important, when you're sitting down to figure out, well, what technology do I need to help make my job easier, to help my employee engagement? You need to question yourself. What are you willing to do? Mm. And, and be realistic. If right now you don't have the time for something with all the bells and whistles, please do not invest in it. Start small. Start, start with the free, and they're not going to like me saying this, but survey monkey. If you wanted to do a free survey, okay, that you're going to send out monthly, and then you say, okay, because it's free, there's no cost investment. Okay, this is what we heard this month. Next month, we're going to check the benefits. Then we're going to check how people feel about vacation, how they feel about comp. And you start crafting a plan and communication plan and a strategy that could be scalable to answer those questions, to fill some holes. And you're validating your employee group that, oh my gosh, they are listening to me. This does matter. And you see, okay, this has been great. We've been able to implement four of the changes throughout the past year that people have asked for. What else can we do at that point? You can look for maybe another different technology resource. You can talk to your payroll provider. Do you have a performance management integration? Is there something else that we should be doing? Is there a way to integrate with Slack? But if you aren't doing anything, biting off a juggernaut of a system is not going to help you. It could right. be a hindrance. Take it in small bites. Figure out what you're, what you're willing to commit to so that you are not damaging the engagement that you're trying to create. Yeah, because so. you know fa false starts are worse, right? Um, yes. And a lot of times there's a lot of false starts. Um, you know, and change is hard. I think it's hard for anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly, you know, for for HR departments that are probably understaffed, and let's or, you know, we could argue that every last one of them is probably understaffed. You know, I yes. remember Sherm put out a statistic for every fifty, you know, full time employees, you need one, you know, HR professional on on the team, and you know, for the most part, I most industry that that's not the case. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that is not the case. You usually have twice as many employees. Uh, and I don't know how accurate the number is, but I, I see the amount of work that, you know, one HR leader, even when they have help have has to do. Now, luckily I think we're, we're getting rid of paper and, and redundancy. I mean, that's one, one of the advantages of technologies that, that it is. are consolidated. Right. Um, but how, do, how do you manage change management? Like, you know, let's say you've decided, I know that I need to make a change, but there's X amount of time in the day and this project is going to, you know, take this amount of time. Let's say three, six months, right? To to implement right. or to change. Like how do you tackle that? Because I think that's a big challenge, especially for, you know, um you know, maybe they take it on, you know, head with kind of the headstrong uh attitude, you know, maybe the uh, a less tenured HR person and they, you know, maybe don't, don't know how big of a problem that, that, that potentially could be. But on the, on the flip side, you know, people who are maybe a little more established in their position and don't want to make the change and, and decide, you know, I'm going to kick it down the, the can down the road, you know, another, another year, maybe talk about both of those. Cause I'm sure you've experienced both like, Hey, it's not that bad. Like, let's just keep it the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, and sometimes it is that bad, but you just don't have the time to change. Sure. I think one of the key things to do is to get cheerleaders, is to okay. find the people within the organization that believe that the change needs to happen. So you're not taking this on by yourself. If you're looking to do a system implementation, but you know that it's going to take three to six months, and it's going to be grueling, and now, oh, by the way, you've got a benefit renewal that's thrown in the middle of there, and now you've got four new hires because you're growing and expanding, and there's more and more that goes on your plate. Form a team. Form a team of cheerleaders. Find people from different departments that you know need this change. Have them buy into it. Have Form your own committee. How would we bring this out? Build out a timeline. Build out an integration. Build out a communication process and a plan so that it's something that you may have three people that believe in this. And then they go out and find three people on their own. And then pretty soon it creates its own momentum. I have done myself so much of a disservice in my career. By thinking, you know, I can do this. I can do this. I love this. This is great. And then you're singing solo huh. versus having a choir. Right. Go out and find your choir members. So I think that's one way to, when you talk about change management, is to get the buy-in of others 
and have them help lead the charge with you. Mm. And it's something then that's shared and it's not something that's solely owned. And there is vulnerability in that. And I think that that's something else that you're going to see or you are seeing is that there is so much discussion around leadership being vulnerable and leaders being vulnerable. And it may completely flop, but you have to give yourself and others the opportunity to have it win, right? Could it fail? Possibly. But at least you're moving forward. There's some momentum. And then the other component, what other component did you ask about? I apologize. It was about change management and making yeah, the just, time. It was it was it was kind of twofold. You know, somebody who's like, ah, oh, it's not that bad. But you also have the, the flip side of somebody who's maybe a little more gung ho to, to make a change. And when you move too quickly, you make mistakes, which I'm yes. I, I'm sure you've seen a lot of times. Yes. So, you know, maybe talk about the the other end of the spectrum. You know, like you, you talked more about you know. Uh, collaboration, getting departments to come together and yep. help, you know, provide some of those resources, their insight and champion um, the idea of change. But maybe, maybe they, they uh, see the need for change. They've got the, the buy-in, but now it's a project and, you know, uh, having to own all of it on themselves with limited bandwidth and limited resources as every HR department I've ever worked yep. with has ever had, always had. Um, like how do you, how do you bring people either, from other parts of the organization to support you? How do you set expectations with potential partners to make sure that they're holding up their end of the bargain? Because, you know, a lot of times they, they feel like they're probably drowning with this this change. And it was initiated by them because there was a need for change. But, um, you know, what are, what are some of the ways that they can kind of tackle those things? And again, I think that goes back into buy-in. Okay, mm -hmm. so people buy in that, yes, we've got to have this change. Then you've got to have agreed, to, agreed upon timeline. How are we going to do this? These are the steps that we're going to have to take. I have been a catalyst for change in an organization that believed that they were ready and they were not. Mm -hmm. And it became very disruptive. So you need to be honest. You need to bring in outside help if you, if you need to, whether it is through the vendor. Let's say you're trying to bring in a software program and you're trying to upgrade or you're trying to do some sort of transition. Do they have a customer support team? What are they, what if you write them a beautiful check or a wire transfer, are they willing to take and lift off of you? Some things are worth paying for, okay? So how can you lift that burden off of your in-house team and perhaps outsource some of it? Is, are there training mechanisms that they can come in and help out with? I think that it's a continued conversation and a commitment. And being realistic and saying, you know what, this is something we really need today, but we're not going to be prepared for it till six months. Okay, then why don't we start the initiation in three months? So by the time that we are building our timeline, we're looking at our resources, we're building out our plan, we're going to have more time available from the things coming off of our plate to commit to this. I think it's an honest conversation and pushing back where you may need to push back and saying, you know, I... It could just go on the other side, though, too, Troy, and say, you know, I know you don't have time. Show me somebody on your team that does. Looking at outside, are there consultants that could come in? I mean, there's a lot of different opportunities to have something happen that you can get, you know, so mired down and, oh, no, this is what we have. Think outside the box. Who else has done this? Talk to your vendor. Do they have consultants that they work with? Can you tell me a business that you work with that was in a very similar situation as, as ours that I can talk to them and maybe see how they've done it? Ask questions, be curious, be fluid, but be honest. Be honest with what you can and can't do and what your team can and can't do. And again, yeah. that involves vulnerability. Yeah, sometimes asking the, the you know the questions in such a way that uh, you know you, you've got to be, I guess, vulnerable. That's That's a really good point. Um, and asking for what you need, I, I think is a, is yes. a really good point that you made. Um, Very much. Be because I think you get halfway in and you didn't have what you needed. I think people uh, who may have previously supported it, you know, get a little bit frustrated when you put all your chips on the table, um, you know, uh, before you get started, I, I, I think you have better dialogue, um, for sure. So let me ask, uh, what are you doing differently at like big communications, uh, to kind of, you know, create an uh, environment that uh, is conducive to these kinds of changes and innovation and, and you know, um, how how much do you think your role currently 
um, relies on technology to, to kind of support those initiatives? So that's, that is a great question. Um, wow, you've got a lot of great questions today, Troy. Um, I have to tell <laughs> you, so my, my role is remote. And so it's one of those things, I've been in a remote role before in human resource leadership role. And it's something that I've had to learn how to be very intentional. And I've also had to learn how to step back. I work with such amazing people at big that are so much more talented and gifted in areas than I am. And I look at that as an added bonus for me. So I try to plug into the people that are fantastic at what they do. I work with some really incredible directors that are experts at what they do. Um, Our office manager, that's her title and she does everything. She lives and breathes and she keeps us alive. Right. And So what I've tried to do with big is to say, this is an idea. This is something that's worked for me in the past. How could we adapt this or embrace this where we're at? When I stepped into the role, we didn't have an HRIS system. There was not an applicant tracking system per se. We didn't have performance management. There are a lot of things that were not necessarily at the level that the organization was. Was it broken? No. Could it be enhanced and scaled? Absolutely. And so I've tried to come in and take what we have and not be disruptive because that's not going to behoove me in any way, shape or form. I've tried to build a talent acquisition platform based upon employee referrals. You know, eight of our last nine hires were employee referrals. So we have an organization that people want to be a part of and it has nothing to do with me and everything to do with what people do for each other. And so some of the things that I'm trying to do there is to take what's good and create a mechanism to make it better and to take the opportunities that we have for growth and have that enhance our current experience and who our employees are, how they show up, what they do. It's, again, it goes back to the people experience. And I'm lucky enough to work at an organization that embraces that. And I say that because I've worked for other organizations where they didn't. I didn't stay there very long because that's yeah. not a good, that's, that's not a good fit for me. You know, that's, but that's, that's why I do what I do and other HR professionals do what they do. I think it's a hard field to be in. It really is. And not that anything is ever easy, but when you start dealing with people, people are, I read once that people are the most valuable product out on the market yet the most amazing and resilient. And when you step back and you look at that, you're dealing with someone, someone shows up to work, they have a life before they walked in the door, they have a life after they leave the door, and yet they come in and you are expecting them to perform something as if nothing ever happened. And so trying to create the organization or to be a part of an organization that allows people to be exactly uniquely who they are is something that I'm lucky enough to have the opportunity to do with Big. That's great. Uh, And and it's hard to do, right? It's hard to, you know, kind of, you know, separate the fact that you've got somebody who has, you know, objectives and other things that, you know, need to happen to to make sure that the business stays afloat. But, you know, they also have a family and they also have, you know, real things that happen. And, um, you know, they have other passions that aren't, you know, data entry or whatever it is that they do for a living, right? Uh, Yes. So yeah, that's that's a great point. And they don't change, those things don't change about that human being when they walk in the door or they sit down at their computer in the morning. No, it doesn't. You know, it's, it's something that I also, a very similar had a conversation about a job description and a job description is going to capture the essence of what you're looking to have executed on a daily basis. But when you go through an interviewing process, the candidates you're interviewing are bringing their uniqueness to that role. And that's something that you're never going to see flushed out on paper. It's never going to come through an applicant tracking system. There is so much to be said for a conversation. And you can see what you need to see, and you may need to validate some of those things that you're going to find on a resume, but actually getting to know the essence of the person, what they're bringing of themselves to a role, and how that's going to fit in your organization. But it's even more important to them as to how it's going to fit into the life. And I think that's what the interviewing process really is starting to shift to is how are we going to make this match happen? Not what are you going to come in? What are you going to do? This is the box we need you to check. It's It starts off as a relationship if you start the conversation that way. And if you start the conversation that way, all the way through the hiring process, the onboarding process, 
that's then going to be their experience within that organization because that's what you outlined when you initially met them. Yeah. And I think that is unique to, you know, companies that, uh, you know, I think ha have seen the, the, the benefits of having diversity, the benefits of having, you know, um, you know, people that don't necessarily uh, fit the mold and, and can help them to kind of stretch their own belief systems. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think in previous years, I mean, they almost wanted you to be a little more robotic to like, you know, just do the job. Like, you know, don't. Yes. Don't have a personal life, you know, don't have, you know, things that you care about or, you know, uh, whatever. And I, I, I just think that that strips so much of the, I, I think, the color in life, you know, when you just go to work and it, it's just a job, yeah. you know. It does. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So uh, bringing this home. So I, I always like to finish with three do's and a don't. And, um, yeah, yeah. and so if you're, if you're talking to your peers right now, um, or okay. really it could be somebody who's just stepped into an HR role. It could be, you know, somebody who's been at it for 10 years and they're looking to implement technology to help them scale their organization. Like what are three things that you would say, Hey, these are three things that you have to do if you're evaluating this. And there's a, here's one thing you should absolutely not do. Don't do it. Okay. Three things to do. Talk to your network, your professional network, your personal network, Talk to your network to see if they have any experience with the technology that you're currently looking for. Nice. Talk to your internal team to ensure that this is a project that you can undertake, that you've got buy-in, that you've got the champions, the cheerleaders, and that you have got those that are going to uplift you and ensure the success of the, this throughout the organization. Make sure that this is something that is an investment for today as well as a long-term goal. And I think that so many times we can look at this is so going to work for us now, but maybe two years from now, it's not going to. So make sure that you're asking the questions as to what the platform is that's scalable. And don't only ask for good references. You want to find out, ask them, ask them, <laughs> give me a customer that had a horrible experience, but is still a customer. Right. Because you're going to get nothing but, oh my gosh, it was so easy and it was so effortless. Great. Tell me somebody that you've upset so I can go and see how you recover from that because it's not the sale. It's not the great experience that everybody has that you want to know about. You want to know about what problems they've had and how that vendor took care of those problems and resolved it because nothing, nothing is perfect. Something's going to fail. Something's going to break. A ball's going to get dropped. Probably while you're on PTO, it's usually what happens right. to me. Don't take and, a vacation, Kelly. You're not allowed to. Yeah, no, I know. You know, I feel that. But it's one of those things that I want to know how you address things when they go wrong. Tell me about that. Right. And I think that's key. Yeah. So don't just go for the great glowing ones. Tell me about somebody that you've, someone you've made mad and how you fixed it. Yeah. And I think that's important. That's a great point. And you actually, uh, you know, normally I just kind of circle the wagons here, but you actually just experienced that. And kudos to the, the you were telling me, kudos to the company who screwed up yes. and didn't do exactly what they were supposed to do. But they, you said they, they, they really recovered. And how, like, yes. if you're listening to this and you're a technology company, there's there's a benefit to to you know bringing the right people in fixing problems because people will feel um even i think more indebted because they you almost went into it expecting that there, there would be problems right i think they were decent sized ones but they fixed them right they fixed them they you know what they fixed them and i think that you know what i had told you is that they oversold and under delivered right and it was not it was such a snowball effect because one thing went wrong then another thing went wrong and then it became this huge, huge problem and no one was listening to me. I could not get, there, there was the roadblock, mm -hmm. you know, you only can make it this far and I couldn't get past it to have someone listen to me. And anyone that knows me and that's watching this is not going to be surprised. I am not going to stay quiet. You know, this <laughs> is what you told me. You, you told me you were going to do this and I'm just asking you to uphold what you told me that we were going to do. Right. And when I was finally able to get someone to listen, it became a beautiful experience because they then like, you are right. First of all, they validated, you're right. We, we dropped the ball. You're right. We screwed this up. You're right. You did this as a client. You never should have had to do this. This is what we're going to do. And then it became one thing after another, after another that they fixed. 
we have a fantastic relationship with our customer service representative. We, we just, I literally had a touch base with her earlier today. We touch base every two weeks, even if it's the 15 minutes, how was your, how was your weekend? It's a relationship and right. they fixed it. And we just, we just signed another two year contract with them. That's great. And, but again, but they also know that if you ever need somebody to say, this is why they're great. And I'm going to talk about why you weren't for a while. I'm, I'm your girl. It's again, I wish that when I had asked that question, they had presented me with the exact same level of honesty that I would present to someone else. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good recovery story. And I know we talked about not naming them, but uh, I, you know, I think it's really just advice for, for anybody who's, li you know, listening in the HCM, you know, technology, software, you know, or really any, you know, service based business that uh, like, look, your, your clients don't expect you to be perfect. They expect you to to respond and help them through, you know, the yeah. the, the, the problems that are inevitable. Right. Yeah, they do. And that's. We all have problems. I mean, every organization has its own slip ups and trip ups. That's just part of life. It's how you recover from that. And what do you do right. that makes you an excellent organization? Do you show ownership and accountability? Do you show remedy? Do you show change in how you're going to try and avoid that from happening again? Yeah. So. Well, you got the just, roadmap yeah. here. So <laughs> that's how you do uh, it. I guess so. <laughs> you, you go down in flames. You know, you get put out by, your, you know, your customer's even willing to throw a bucket of water on you and say, hey, look, I know it's everything's on fire, but let's let's work through this. Um, yeah. Beautifully, beautifully put. So um, I always like to ask, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for coming on here. You've been a great thank guest, you. Kelly. Um, where where can people find you? You know, uh, I am you, you know, network with you, poke you for advice. What's what's the best format for yeah. people to, to kind of reach out and, and be in your atmosphere? LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn. And then LinkedIn, that starts an initial conversation. We then can connect privately. I can help. I, there's an individual that I'm working with right now that came from a friend of a friend of a friend who actually just went through a layoff. And her discipline is very unique, but it's something I've worked with before. So I've actually been able to connect her with three different recruiters to help her. You nice. know, put good out there, good comes back. Sure. It really does. So if you want to find me, I'm on LinkedIn, Kelly Hutchinson. I'm right now with Big Communications. So if you go to the Big Communications website, I'm there as well. So there's a couple of different mechanisms. Um, I'm on the Forbes HR Council. I've got my own page there. So I, you can find me. You, you can find me. And if people she, need something, and you know just don't what? If, if you if you want to find her, you can always hit me up, and I'll connect you. I find Troy. I kind of we I, we know each other. That's all I'm saying. We've known each other for years. <laughs> for and a that's long why time. It's like, yeah. I, I know we have. And no, yeah. Troy, Troy knows how to find me as well. So, yeah. So but, hit me up. Yeah, but I'm uh, happy to help. yeah, if you want to go direct, she she gave you some addresses. Hit her up. And uh, so thank you so much. Make sure if you enjoyed, you know, uh, the the conversation, you got something from Kelly to boop the like button to show your support to her and subscribe to the what the tech podcast and we want to thank you so much for listening i know you're out there on apple podcasts you know google podcasts certainly watching us on youtube so we appreciate all the viewers and listeners and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you next week thank you again troy this is great thanks kelly